Hello, everyone. Welcome to all the folks in person and attending virtually and attending into the future. So welcome to the Academy of Management's fifth ever subject matter expert scholar panel and the first ever to be presented at an annual meeting. Now in its 82nd year presented here in Seattle, Washington in a hybrid format. Thank you to our scholar panelists for your time sharing your expert research-based insights on these critically important topics today. And thank you to everyone once again for attending and viewing. So quick background on AOM's SME program. It began in 2020 and has grown to over 90 academic scholars. The program's goal is to help AOM and its scholars further impact and shape the workplace and the future of work by engaging regularly with media on the latest trending organizational and management topics. Today's panel is titled AOM Scholars On, Measuring Real Real world impact of scholarly research. This panel will feature research based insights that answer the question How are AM scholars and management scholars at large turning their insights and published research into solutions for the workplace? Such solutions could help answer the biggest organizational challenges faced today. This panel's focus was chosen to directly relate to the annual meeting's theme Creating a Better World Together. For attending scholars and media, Please submit questions via the AOM portal and via Zoom. And for in-person, at the end of the, the panel, we'll, we'll take questions live. So thank you again for your time. Thank you to our panelists. And without further ado, I'll kick it over to today's moderator, Jean Partunek of Boston College. Thank you very much, Mike. It's, it's a delight to be here with all of you here in person and with everybody who now or later will watch this panel. I should also tell you that my new distance glasses are on order. <laughs> so for I can vaguely see that there are some people back there. <laughs> so in terms of when you have questions, thank you for waving. That's awesome. <laughs> in terms of when you have questions, Mike will be in charge <laughs> of seeing what they are. Your distance classes work, right? Yeah, I'll get it very well. Okay. So we're going to start with introductions. From, from our left to our right. Um, so I'm asking you all just to introduce yourselves, your university, your college, that, that under the weird assumption that not all practitioners are totally identical to each other. <laughs> what kinds of practitioners do you usually work with? And that could include college and graduate students as well as others. And what's the kind of What's the emphasis of your scholarly work? So, Leon, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. I'm Leon Prieto, and I serve as a professor of management at Clayton State University. And I also serve as a visiting research fellow at Cambridge Judge Business School in their Center for Social Innovation. So, um, my research lies at the intersection of management history, critical management studies, and management education. And I work with practitioners every day in school. Uh, most of my students are non-traditional students. They have families, they have full-time jobs, some are managers, and I work with them very closely at times, serving as an advisor and things like that. Other practitioners I work with stem from the economic justice and cooperative space, right? So a lot of my research interests stems around um, those types of organizations, cooperative enterprises. And many of the practitioners within that space are very passionate, they're activists, and I usually attend some of their meetings as well to bridge that divide. So that's a little bit about me and my work. Hi, everybody. I'm Carol Kulik. I am a Bradley Distinguished Professor at the University of South Australia. And broadly speaking, my research focuses on how we could design work and workplaces to be more inclusive of a diverse workforce. Most of the practitioners that I work with are frontline managers. Some of them work directly in a human resources function, but more often they have other kinds of functional responsibilities alongside managing people. Uh, I think my research is very relevant to anyone who has responsibility for other people in organizations. I'm Jean Bartunek. I'm the, I hold the Ferris Chair in the Management and Organization Department at Boston College, where I've been longer than many of you have been alive. 
since 1977. Um, my, my interest has been mostly working with organization development consultants and other types of consultants who are particularly interested in organizational change. And I've been interested for some time in the kind of work they do, how they make sense of it. And I've been collaborating with consultants for some time in writing together. And I can describe a little of that later. Usha. Hi, everyone. I'm Usha Haley. I'm currently the Barton Distinguished Gen International Business and a professor of management at Wichita State University. I guess I work with both managers and policymakers. So, for example, I am the elected chair of the World Trade Council of Wichita, and we have people there from the Wichita aircraft manufacturers. All of them are based in Wichita, as well as companies such as Cargill and Coke and smaller and medium-sized enterprises as well. I also work with policymakers, and I guess that is where I probably have had the greatest impact. Currently, I serve on the Trade Council for the Kansas governor, but I think my work on Chinese subsidies which had been, which has been directly incorporated into federal regulation in both the United States as well as Germany, the EU, Australia, and India, is probably where I have had the greatest uh, measurable impact. This is difficult to top having an impact on billions of dollars worth of trade. Thank you very much. Um, so, hope, as you can see, our our panelists work with different types of practitioners on a regular basis. Um, and we have a few questions here to, that we will try to respond to. If you have questions, please put them in chat. I think that's the easiest way to get them to Mike. Um, so even if you're, or just hand them to Mike. He's, <laughs> that might be easier in the room. Stand up just for a second. So, but, but we're, we're going to respond. We're going to answer a few questions first. One person is assigned to answer each question and others are invited to chime in, but they don't have to because we also want to make room for your questions. So, Carol, what, if anything, has worked well for you in ensuring that your research has had some positive impact on organizations and are for workers outside the proverbial walls of the university? I love this question. I think it's a, it's a really good one. So here's the thing. I think that as management scholars, we study really big, important issues, gender inequality, unemployment, environmental sustainability. And as scholars, we know that big problems need big solutions. These are systemic issues. And so we need systemic solutions. But so many of the practitioners that I work with they don't have the kind of power or resources to introduce that kind of big systemic change. So one of the things that's really worked in my interactions with practitioners is, yes, identify the big solution, what the end goal is, but also to identify one small step, something that they can implement immediately, something that they can do directly in their roles ideally without having to ask permission from the organization or from their, from their boss. I think part of the goal is just to get some traction on the problem and get things moving forward. Anybody else want to add to that? Oh, I could. I could give it a shot. I mean, for me, what has worked, and again, I'm glad, Jean, that you made the distinction between different kinds of practitioners, is writing white papers congressional testimony. I mean, it reaches a very wide audience and also writing books. <laughs> um, I mean, Elon Musk famously said, I read books. And what I have found is that a lot that's of- That's not all he does. Sorry? That's not all he that's does. That's not all he does. <laughs> that's no, not sorry, all he continue. does. <laughs> but uh, he did say, I mean, I've, I have found that a lot of practitioners and policymakers read books. Yeah, and I will- um... Piggyback on what you just said, um, the Academy has a relationship with Nonprofit Quarterly, which is a magazine based in um, Massachusetts. So um, they graciously translated uh, one of my uh, AMLE papers into a nonprofit nonprofit quarterly article, and it reached a much wider audience. And I received emails from practitioners and invited to podcasts. 
So it helps if we translate our work from, you know, the hard to read academy articles into something more digestible for practitioners and that they can actually use it in their practice. And, and I'll just toss something in that's um, not quite an answer to this, but it's, it's very meaningful to me. I think probably many of you are familiar with the, some of the work of Peter Segge, starting with his book, The Learning Organization, uh, some decades ago. He runs a group called Compassionate Systems Awareness that involves training of people involved in education all over the world in their capacity for that type of for developing compassionate systems. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to participate in some of his work, which is meaningful to me. It's not just my research, but it feeds my research, but it's also a way I can, I, I can and easily celebrate the work that really competent, skilled consultants like Peter carry out. So I think for, I, I will assume for all of us, we, we do not go on the expectations that we're the four hotshot academics and you, anybody who isn't us is really lucky, although you are. <laughs> but, but that there are many people carrying out practice who are really skilled in what, yeah. in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Hey, Lucia. Oh, I, actually, based on I, your experience, oh, oh, yeah? you, you want to say something else? Or? No, no. <laughs> based on your experience, what advice do you have for others, especially early career or junior scholars who want their work to have a positive societal impact? Thanks for asking that one, Jean, because we've just finished a rather large study through SAGE, and we um, looked at business academics across the world. And we found out that 95% of them, 95% of them wanted their work to have a positive impact outside of academics. That is, they wanted to mold society and do something positive there. And most of them, like over 80%, wanted their work to appeal to an external audience. And yet, when you asked them, did your administrators, did your evaluators of the institutions support your efforts? Just about a third said that they supported their efforts in various ways, such as tenure and promotion or research, you know, support at the universities. And a stunning third said that their administrators gave them absolutely no support. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that although 84% said they would love for their work to have an external impact and speak to audiences, this is different from the 94% that said they wanted to have a positive impact. Only about 64% said, and this is part of a paper that I'm working on with Andrew Jack in the Financial Times uh, for Sage. It's going to be spread out as a white paper. 64% uh, they write primarily to further their careers. Also, what was disturbing is a recent survey done by a THE, the Times Higher Education, who said that across the board, uh, administrators, evaluators place the greatest emphasis on publishing in prestigious journals. <laughs> and for them, that, tra that translated to journal rankings and journal impact factors. Um, surprisingly, they have gone down a bit on citations because of the number of studies that show that there's conspicuous self-citation. Just because you cite somebody doesn't mean you're necessarily saying something nice about them. I mean, you could be disparaging their research. And also, there is all sorts of coercion that goes on in academic circles through editors as well as uh, journals getting people to cite certain works. So in that way, they have reduced the number of emphasis, reduced the emphasis on citations, but increased on prestigious journal outlets. So my, uh, I'm, I'm risk averse generally, and my advice to junior scholars would be your, before you get tenure, publish, try to publish in those prestigious journals. After that, though, I mean, it's going to be difficult because interdisciplinary research also, we've shown, has the greatest impact. Try to work on broader topics, not just what my friend Gary Cooper says, 
standing on one leg doing Lizrael. He says, that is not in fact. Try to work on broader topics. Try to work with practitioners, although that may be more difficult. But certainly that would give you the most leverage once you get tenure. And my advice would be after you become a full, um, you know, associate professor with tenure, then concentrate on having a broader impact. There are many uh, dead ends. It's not, a, it's not a smooth process, but aim at that. And uh, can I just that, say one that more thing? That is sure encouraging advice that you're giving to junior scholars. May I just say one more thing? I need to plug a special issue that I'm very excited about that we just completed for the Academy of Management, Learning, and Education. And I promise I will shut up after this. Uh, a group of editors and I, we put out a special issue for AMLE, which is a top journal, ironically, it's an A star, ABDC, et cetera. But what I'm thrilled about is that we had people from all walks of life. I mean, not just major scholars like Jean, but also people who are establishing themselves, it's, you know, publishing in our special, wanting to publish in our special issue and talk about impact and the various methods and, and means to achieve it. And that special issue is coming out in September. And we also have scholars from around the world. So it isn't just an American phenomenon, as so many are. And um, I just, I, I do hope you look into that as well. Yeah, I could jump in as well for this question. Um, so my advice for early career scholars is to look at the fascinating work being done by some of our current scholars in the academy. Um, the work of Stella and Como, Laura Morgan Roberts, Simone Phipps, Paul Tracy, Steve Cummins, Andrew Crane, Tima Bansal. So there's a number of scholars doing some really impactful work that is going beyond the academy. And um, so le learn from their work and also try to find your own voice while learning from the work of others and then join that conversation. And that, of course, is easier said than done, especially based on the context we are located. You know, some universities may not value um, certain types of research and things like that. But, um, but as academics, we are also activists. So we have to put on our academic battle armor and go out there and do the research that you feel passionate about. And you will always get pushback and it will come from all sides and it'll come from well-intentioned people. But at the end of the day, you should know exactly how you'd like to make your contribution to academia. I love Leanne's advice about putting yourself out there wearing, wearing your armor. Um, hopefully you don't need the armor too much, but it's good to have it at the ready. Only um, with your dean. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you play Academy of Management bingo, um, some of the words that are most likely to come up in the hallways are dissemination and translation. And I think those words are very much a reflection of the way I was trained to be an academic. Um, I think many of us who are more senior scholars tend to think about our engagement with practitioners as happening at the back end. Uh, it happens after you have a finding and then you go out and you sort of try to sell it. Um, honestly, I don't think that is the only way. It is a good way, but it's only part of a larger action portfolio. And so the advice that I would give to junior scholars is to engage with practitioners much earlier in the process. Go where the practitioners are. Go to practitioner conferences. It doesn't have to be expensive. There's probably groups of practitioners gathering in your local city. Um, eavesdrop on them. Find out what their vocabulary is. Uh, find out what's keeping them up at night. And I think as a result, you will feel much less challenged at the back end to make your research relevant to practitioners because it's been baked in from the start. Um, I'm going to just stick in a question which is not quite in here, but I think it's, it's pertinent to what we're talking about right now. This question asked about a positive societal impact. The first question asked about impact on organizations and our workers, and I helped to create the questions, and I admit I didn't even notice this, but, but is there any difference between wanting your work to have a societal impact and wanting your work to be impactful within a particular organization, particular, say as a, 
as a in a kind of consulting role. I mean, I will say there is an impact scholars community for junior faculty members and doctoral students who are interested in in helping them. And so anybody can join, and I encourage you to do it. They have regular presentations. Uh, interested in helping them figure out what can you do to have more of an impact. But I'm curious. I think it's worth thinking about what does it mean to have a societal impact as opposed to a within organizational impact? And what are the if are there any implications for scholars work with with any sets of practitioners? Can I start that one? Yes. Um because I have a pretty strong embedded opinion opinion on this. In fact, it appears, I think, in my LinkedIn profile. Um, I believe that we're making the world a better place, one manager, one workplace at a time. Uh, so I don't really see it as a dichotomy. I see it as very much a cumulative effect. And I think that potentially we can address it from two ends of the continuum, or we can make it top down, bottom up. But I certainly don't think they're exclusive. I, I agree. And I think it's an excellent question, actually. I think it's a level of analysis issue. I think it matters when you impact individuals, organizations, as well as society. But the impact, I mean, it's it's actually a long-term phenomenon. If you look at it, say, five years down the road and then see what has had an impact or not. And in the meantime, we have metrics to gauge that. I did a very interesting study. Well, I mean, I was on a very interesting panel, judging panel with, for the Financial Times, where we looked at impactful research over a period of three years. And we found out that people could have significant measurable impact. That is, some, you know, vaccines, for example, being adopted by hospitals or other methods of looking at how um, hospitals run and people are cured. So you can, the long-term impact, I, I think that's up in the air. But doesn't mean we can't have medium-term impact. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so organizational impact can turn into a broader societal impact. Um, so some of the work we may do with organizations may become best practices, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. it may impact the entire industry and have that measurable impact that we're all looking for. Mm -hmm. Ripple effects. Exactly. Uh, on that note, Leanne, <laughs> what are some helpful ways... <laughs> You found that scholars could approach various kinds of practitioner relationships, which is a slightly different notion than just impact. And are there ways that practitioners could approach relationships with scholars? Yes, definitely. Um, sometimes when I get papers um, published, I will reach out to organizations and um, various groups that may find a use for my paper. I don't like my academic work to just collect cobwebs somewhere, you know, just be read by other academics. So um, I remember like last year or two years ago, um, I wrote this paper and I emailed this think tank related to cooperatives. And it started this really rich and robust dialogue. And I nurtured that relationship. And then it led to um, them inviting me to work on creating an online worker cooperative program that was made free for um, minority black and brown folks who are into the cooperative economic space. And so I was able to reach a much broader um, audience. And I also like to attend meetings when I'm invited to um, various groups um, practitioners within that economic justice space. So I attend their meetings, have engaged in dialogue with them, and we get to work together. And it's also helpful if you get to co-create knowledge with some of these practitioners. And I even work on short, punchy articles with some of them and get it published in um, the popular press. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm allowed to um, work and engage with them in that way and then we find common ground and when you work with them on these short punchier um, those short punchy articles it reach a much broader audience as well yeah. and then it will circle back onto the original um, academic paper so I, those are some of the ways I tend to do it could you just mention like one of the places where some of your short articles are, are 
published or made available. Okay, so I mentioned um, non-profit quarterly. Yes. And I also um, wrote some punchy articles at um, Harvard Business Review. And um and also Harvard Business Publishing have, have a really nice outlet called Inspiring Minds. So some of my work has been shared widely from those outlets. And like recently I saw um the black the richest um the wealthiest black billionaire in the US shared one of my articles on LinkedIn and having a discussion with his network. And I was like, wow. You know, so um I never expected um that type of response but um it was you know it's it's just flattering to see and and it's also good to see people really engaging with a topic around racial equity and stakeholder capitalism those are some of the themes i addressed in that article and i believe uh, more people saw it because it was in one of those outlets that's that's more widely accessible so why don't um among the people I agree with uh, with Leon completely. I think we ignore the media. And so this effort by Steve and Mike to get our view point across is very important. Um, and you don't really have to come from, I mean, I've heard so many excuses. You don't really need to be in a very prestigious brand name school. You don't need to be uh, putting out research that's in ASQ to get in. You really have to distill your thoughts to get out. And that reaches enormous uh, just to give you an example, I'm not holding myself up as a, as a model, but I'm in the media almost weekly. And I'm talking about the Washington Post, Financial Times, New York Times, Harvard Business Review is a great place to get into, by the way. Uh, they get a lot of uh, publicity for uh, ideas. And you sort of develop, uh, and I don't have a PR person. I've done this for now almost two decades. I've been getting into the media, but you don't need a PR person. I certainly can't afford one. So Could you be one for all <laughs> when I've got, I've got projects to finish, but I'm glad to help if I can. Yeah. Um, you know, I I think it's very important to get just get your name out and your ideas out. It helps also, and I, I know you will probably not get any uh, sort of um, acknowledgement for this when going up for tenure or promotion. But we wrote a couple of best-selling books. They were on New York, uh, on the Wall Street Journal, et cetera, best-selling books. And those got a lot of track, you know, traction. We got calls, and those are some of the best sources for my ideas. We got calls from the government saying, you know, we really can't explain what's going on here. Can you help? Calls from companies. So that sort of outreach uh, pays off as well. That's my experience. You know, I'm still thinking about those junior scholars from the previous question. Yeah, and it's not going to get you tenure and promotion. <laughs> well, and, and writing a book is a really big investment. So let's see if we can find some first steps. Um, my position is, I think it's completely okay to preach to the choir. Um, in the work that I do, I know that research on diversity and inclusion is most likely to get traction among HR managers. We speak a very similar language. Um, so I don't necessarily have to reach the CEO on my first go. I don't necessarily have to reach the executive committee on my first go. Um, if I can talk with an HR manager and I can give them some resources and tools so that they can get some traction in their organization, that's a great start. Um, so in a lot of the work that I do, when I think about practitioner relationships, I think about it as passing the baton. Um, I'm trying to give them a way to initiate change downstream. And one of the things I loved about what you said, Leon, was uh, your comment about how you saw the potential in this think tank. I think that's a really good way to think about where is their fertile ground where we might be able to throw our seeds and they'll be able to, to grow and be nurtured. Uh, I'd like to comment on this too. Um, I ended up having a pandemic project um, Ed Shine had written to me about his, he just early in the pandemic, noticing that, while well, we're not messing up the climate as much anymore. And maybe this is meaningful. And he had suggested that I publicize, you know, I set up a, uh, basically an email shared list because a lot of the people are a little older than 
TikTok age. Um, what, what that led to was some other things. Was I ended up editing a book that included chapters by both consultants and academics entitled Social Scientists Confronting Global Crises. And that ended up being really valuable for me. One of the one of the reason one of many reasons it was valuable was it showed if we're concerned about societal issues, academics and consultants are on the same side. People talk about these these gaps and how do you form a bridge? And what if you're on the same side of the bridge because you're concerned about something bigger? that you can both contribute to. So the book includes chapters by some academics. It also includes some very skilled consultants like Sandra Janoff, um, like Otto Scharmer, like Peter Segge, like a couple of the folks who are involved in Rio's Partners, which does incredible work dealing with conflict around the world that most of the academics wouldn't know about. But academics had something to add about how to think about issues like these. So I, I think one of the things that's valuable in relationships is to think about what are ways we're on the same side as opposed to just what are ways we aren't. And one of the ways to think about relationships is who are your friends? I mean, it's, it's a kind of simple th thing. Sandra Janoff and I, she, she is the head of the Future Search Network, lives in Philadelphia. She had, and Bob Marshak, who was one of the people who helped develop Dialogic OD, I've gotten to be really good friends with them over the years. And that helps a lot in create, it, literally, it's relationships. Yeah. Trust-based relationships. They have to trust you. I think that goes for every walk of life. But certainly, if you want ideas and if you want cooperation. Um, so I'm supposed to take the next question first, which is, first of all, how many of you who are here in person are familiar with AOM Insights? Okay, that's... That's really good. <laughs> that's awesome. That's got to be really rewarding for AOM to know that Insights is having an impact on people. And some of my former students have used it a lot in teaching, for example, as really good ways of conveying important information. But um, what steps beyond Insights can scholars take to ensure we are translating sometimes esoteric research findings, notes? Hard to believe that into digestible information for non-academics. Um, well, here's here's one that I just learned about yesterday, but it looks really promising. Wendy Smith and Marianne Lewis have just published a book called Both and Thinking, which is about dealing with paradox. And they were telling me that their publisher, Harvard Business Review Press, told them they had to get their language simpler. And one of the ways they use for that is Hemingway Editor. There's a Hemingway app that's, that's a modern version of, there, there used to be one, I mean, I'm sure it still exists, where it can tell you on what grade level your writing is. And they, they had thought that when, even when they were writing, they thought, man, we're, we're doing an awesome job. And they discovered it was 12th grade writing it, and the Harvard Business Review Press said, you've got to get it down to eighth grade level. <laughs> and they used this thing, and eventually it worked. So I, I think it, it's, uh, I'm without knowing anything more about that than what I've just heard from them and looking it up online, I think something like that is a really useful a really useful thing to have to take anything esoteric that we're saying and making it a little less esoteric. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things I have sometimes found in practice, in collaborating with practitioners, collaborating with consultants and writing something, is that the stuff that for them is the most helpful is a construct, some theoretical construct, some academic development that helps them make sense of experience they've had that they haven't had words to explain. So, um, so it does not mean. Uh, Here's my full-fledged model with my uh, uh, predict variables, my outcome variables, my mediators, my moderators, and here's here's, here's an explanation of the whose theory before means it's legitimate for me to say that. That's um, you don't actually often need to say that in regular conversation with people, but I I, I really have found that just constructs are, are helpful. So anybody else want to? Yeah, I do, actually. I mean, if Einstein could make E equals MC squared known to everyone, we can make our ideas simple and understandable. Uh, I got some disturbing well, I data. Would say I completely understand E equals MC squared. Okay, but, 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 you, <laughs> but close enough, right? I mean, we can, no, I think what you're saying is important <laughs> because we don't have to under, understand all the math, but what you're yeah. saying is... I, is, the, is the basic notion does make sense. Yeah. So last night I got some data that we're writing another paper on, and we looked at how much management scholars were either cited by academics, mostly ourselves, or cited in the media. And we found out that despite all our efforts, the amount that we've been cited in the media has actually gone down relative to every other college in, the, in a university. That's business scholars. And also that we're cited a great deal more than anyone else, but all only by ourselves. That is, business schools are citing each other constantly. And that seems to also be what we found out in a, in a survey that we put out uh, for, to the, for the Academy of Management uh, through the practice theme committee. That is, most management academics seem to think that the greatest influence we have is on other management academics. Now, I don't know about you, but this doesn't seem to be the right way to have an external impact or, or to reach society at large. So I do think we need to change some of our parameters. Jean started this question by talking about words, and I'm going to jump on that and make a point about numbers. Um, it seems to me that many of us who are quantitatively trained automatically think about regression. So more of this in the predictor side means more of that on the outcome side. And whenever I talk to media, they always say, yeah, but by how much? You know, they're always sort of trying to like get it down to like, not just bigger is better, but how much better and so one of the things that I've become really conscious about in my own research is how important it is that we give practitioners a metric to understand how important our finding is. So just to give you a really specific example, uh, one of the things I study is engagement among older workers. Now, I talk to an HR manager and they get it immediately. We want an engaged workforce that's just automatically important. But when they take that message to a finance manager, how important is it? But if we recognize that older workers are probably your most highly paid employees, and if those people aren't delivering the full value of their salary, you can get it down to a financial metric and say, if you don't have engagement, you're wasting a significant proportion of your salary dollars. And that's, again, thinking a little bit about the vocabulary, the words that practitioners use, uh, but try, trying to find a way to communicate the value of our finding to them in a metric that they can use internally. Yeah, all those are really good approaches. And another approach we could use to translate some of our esoteric research, um, other than writing books, which is great, um, is to also contact some of these textbook authors. Anytime we put out what we feel to be cutting edge research. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we just assume that they would just pick up an article and and uh, put it in your textbook, but it doesn't always work like that. So you may have to be proactive and email a, um, a fellow scholar who wrote an influential textbook and share your research with them. 
and also try to communicate it in a, um, I don't want to say an A grade level because they will understand exactly what your research is about, but try to think of the non-academic end user who will use that research in the future for practice. So reaching out to the textbook authors play a big role as well because our students are going to be the future managers and leaders and workers, et cetera. I love uh, Leon's point about um, reaching out to textbook authors. But the other thing I think we can do that's maybe even a step more proactive is why not just write that into your article right at the beginning? You know, discussion sections are actually pretty long. Um, there's enough room in there that you can write a sound bite, a here's why managers need to know this. Uh, please don't fall back on the we need to train managers more or organizations need to be aware of. The more tangible we can make that, the more likely it is that we're giving something that the reader, the textbook writer, uh, the person who's sharing the article, something to pick up and take forward. Uh, what, one, one person in addition who comes to mind is Andy Hoffman, who may, I, I don't know if he's at this meeting, but he is, he is, he, he has published a book recently called The Engaged Scholar. Mm -hmm. That is a brilliant book. He, you can also watch him on YouTube giving a variety of talks on the, on engaged scholars. You know, Andy Vandeven, who passed away at, at the end of April, had written about engaged scholarship as ways of academics and practitioners can collaborate in, in research. But um, one of the things Andy Hoffman has commented, for example, gee, I can go give a talk at the Academy of Management, and then I can give a talk at the Sierra Club. At one of them, I'll be dressed up wearing a suit. And one of them, I'll be dressed up like a lumberjack or something like that, a flannel shirt at least. But I think learning how to see the value of, of having two sets of what can be very complementary conversations, I, I really think makes a difference. And one of the things he also talks about is a number of platforms on which he writes something for others. I, so I, I was really glad a lot of you are familiar with Insights. How many of you are familiar with a platform called The Conversation? That, that's great. That's, I mean, that's something that's across many countries. There are other platforms. I can't remember all of them right now, but there's one EIX for entrepreneurship. Of folks, there's one. There's a strategy scholars network for people at strategy, and there are many others. And I think learning how to just write something on those kinds of platforms, which will which will help you value a Hemingway app, can be can be really helpful. Yeah, but Gene, to go back to that first point, you've yeah. got to get some credit for it yeah. for your career. So if nobody at your university or <laughs> yeah. institution values a conversation piece or a blog in LSE social impact, yeah. you know, then it's, it's not, it's, it's an, it erodes you. Gee, but, Lushet, one of the questions is, are there any incentives for doing this? Yeah. Are I, there any disincentives? <laughs> I, I think you maybe have come up with some pretty good disincentives. Disincentives. But the incentives are also there. And I think Leon yeah. touched upon it. The passion. The interest in your work. I think everyone has an innate desire to want to reach out. When I've given this talk about having an impact, it's generally the young scholars in the room who walk away saying, but I want to have an external impact. I don't just want to talk to other academics. You know? and, and that's what they eventually become, though. Through the system, they end up talking to other academics, period. And that group gets smaller and smaller and more and more specialized. So in order to keep engaging with your ideas, seeing it from different perspectives, as you pointed out, taking the effort to reach out, to have outreach, you need to care about what you do. So before anybody else says something, I, I think that's a really good point. How many of you are working in universities where you are incentivized for connecting with practice? 
um, two or three, four people. Let's should we say that's good or bad? How many of you are in universities where you're actively disincentivized for connecting with uh, practice? Me, me. <laughs> I yeah. uh, I have been at universities, not just the present one, where I've written books that have been. Actually, President Obama has put in letters saying we've used this. And I've been told, uh, well, it counts as much as, a, as an Academy of Management presentation. <laughs> this is with the Oxford University Press. It's a scholarly outlet. It's a sole authored book. It's just, um, I mean, the, I would just say the level of ignorance about what we want to do with research is astounding. I'm sorry for being so negative. No, that's okay. I mean, people who have experienced that have experienced it strongly. Well, other things, it sounds like to me, to me, just looking at those of you who are here, is that for a few of you, you're told, do not do this. For a few of you, you're told, this is well. It sounds like for others that it's, it's not that salient one way or the other, perhaps because you don't work at a university. I don't know, but I, th I think it's worth it paying attention. I mean, you, you mentioned, Carol, if companies want to know, are older people engaged? Are younger, are, younger are younger scholars engaged? And how in academia? I was thinking, Jean, that maybe this is a really good place to apply that both in thinking. Um, you know, often when I talk, to my colleagues, I say, you shouldn't think of it as doing this or that. Um, I personally would never want an article on a website blog to replace a publication in an academy of management journal. Uh, but I think we invest so much into our scholarship. Uh, we invest so much into a publication. You've probably invested years of your life in collecting the data, writing it up, dealing with reviewer feedback. To me, this is all the embroidery around the edges that will make sure it gets embedded, that it takes root, that it reaches a wider audience. So once you have the article, translating it, disseminating it, um, helping to get it to reach other audiences, that's the icing on the cake. But the ingredients of that article matter as well. If you're doing two variable studies, it's unlikely that after you get published in a major journal, that anyone outside is going to have an interest. Well, yeah, definitely. So um, definitely translate those articles and put it out there. And, and there's something to be said about good old-fashioned intrinsic motivation. You know, you're not going to get rewarded for every blog piece you put out. Um, but, you know, but you do feel really good when you see practitioners, like recently I just typed in um, uh, a construct. There's this thing I worked on called Cooperative Advantage, and I just typed it in on, on Facebook and Twitter to see what the practitioners are saying. And, and then I came across various groups, non-academics, talking about short articles I wrote about. And I found that to be really exhilarating. Yes, I wasn't really rewarded in the form of a course release or extra pay or any or some kind of incentive towards tenure and things like that. But the intrinsic motivation by just seeing people actually using your work for good, you know. So there's something to be said about intrinsic motivation. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. And Mike, you, I think you've been collecting questions. First, we'll take any questions from the audience, and we have a few written questions that we'll pose. So, well, the hard ones go to Gene. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll assign them to somebody. Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your insights. My uh, basic question I have is, how do we actually measure uh, real world impact? Because that's the title of the session. And a lot of discussion has been on how to engage and how to sort of uh, make an impact. But uh, I'm still sort of figuring out, uh, have you paid attention to also like how you try to measure it? Is it a different kind of major like for example citations you use in uh academic work are you using a different metric 
to engage different kind of uh, audience that you have outside. Yeah. Thank you. I I think that's a great question, and and we haven't talked about that. The thing I would recommend is uh, UK government now d- does a research as ex- excellence framework yeah. measure every 10 years or so of every department at every university. And one of the things they have is 25%, I think, of the measure is what does impact mean? And for them, impact sometimes means getting a letter from the company, from a company president saying you really helped. Um, there, there, there are different ways of measuring impact that, that they're still, I think they're helping to invent, frankly. Uh, so I, I think what we have been saying is still at a very low level of measure, very general level of, of, of measurement. But it means, I think, that we are aware of people in practice making use of something that we said. Yeah, I agree with um, with, with what was said completely. REF is um, ways ahead of us, light years ahead of us. And But the ASCSB is also coming up with differentiating between outputs and outcomes. So outputs are the numbers of publications, just the raw numbers, and the outcomes is what you can actually, what is actually achieved. You know, what have you done with these publications? And there is an element of outreach involved, but then all outreach is not equal. So, so I get into the media. Every time I get into the media, I don't have an effect. And so there's got to be, but say I get my work into federal regulation. Yes, that is an effect. I mean, there are, there are distinctions, there are subtleties. Um, the Academy of Management, when we asked them, said people in, in the memberships gave us about 10 or 15 types of impact. There's very little difference between them, between these different impacts, including talking to managers, getting into the media. But the five top ones were... Um, you know, getting prestigious academic journal articles, peer-reviewed scholarly books, citations, research grants like NSF, et cetera. Uh, among those would be the top, and uh, would be among the top um, bench ways of getting impact. I think that we, as management scholars, need to train ourselves to ask about impact. And I'll give you two really specific examples. Um, One of the things that I have started doing, if I collect survey data from organizations and I send them the traditional feedback report summarizing the findings, I always follow up a month later, six months later, saying, give me some feedback on the feedback report. Tell me how you used it in organizations, Mm -hmm. actively asking that question. And some of the information I get back is fascinating about where they're discussing the results. Uh, The second thing I'm going to suggest is much more individual. Uh, One of the things I have become much more brazen about is that if I ever get feedback from a practitioner face-to-face, I say, do you mind sending me an email and putting that in writing? Uh, Because I need to show it to my boss. And People who work in organizations understand how important that is, how important the documentation is. It's, it's not seen as offensive or narcissistic. You know, they know how organizations work. Mike, more questions? Okay. First of all, thank you. Big thanks. I'm Hillary with the Action Research Plus Foundation. So thinking from a place of the world is literally on fire, as we know, and academia has an enormous amount of resource, the intellectual capital that is there. So thinking with you more about the, the uh, you know, how, how do we leverage this more? And I'm seeing some good examples, for example, in the Nordic world and wondering, uh, precisely because it's built in at a governance governance level that that academia, because of the funding model, is different, right, um, has to produce more usable knowledge. But one thing that I would also uh, ask about is, do you see uh, leveraging student teaching in our research, right? Like, 
MBA students, the also huge generational impact. Da, 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 da. So I'm looking for, I think, those bigger systems changing, leveraging that, you know, if you have ideas and how do we help it happen? Yeah, th- thank you, Hillary. Um, I, I think we totally underestimate the value of teaching in terms of impact. I, I think that that is, I, I would be willing to bet that that's the most crucial way that we have an impact or not, depending on how we decide to teach classes and how much we decide to say, look how this relates to something that's going on in the world or do an assignment to show how this relates to something that's going on in the world that matters. Mm-hmm. So I, I think uh, I think that um, is, is a, just a gigantic component that we're missing. The, the other thing... Um, yeah, yeah. The other thing is, that I've noticed that the publications that I'm getting are more and more dealing with really societal issues. Like there have been quite a few on refugees, for example, recently. And I think what you're calling for and action research, when it works, addresses is how do you how do you use the knowledge that we have as academics to Try to make a difference in the real world and see how that see what that actually see what actually happens. So I just um, so I I just want to say what you're what you're doing is really important, and I think you would be a really valuable person to work with to make that kind of impact. Okay. Can may I say something as well? I think students are extremely important, but it's very difficult to track influence on students and then what they communicate to the outer world. And institutions, as you know, run on metrics. So how do you actually measure your impact on students and what then they relate to the outer world? Um, and I don't think, I think teaching evaluations are fraught with, with problems. And they're highly biased, especially in the research that shows that, especially against women and minorities. So um, I don't want, I give, want to give one last pitch to the special issue that we just completed for the Academy of Management, Learning, and Education. We have several avenues for impact uh, through the classroom, including having an impact on marginalized communities. So I recommend you look, you look at that. And I'll say one thing real quickly. Um, I believe in co-creating knowledge with students. So I work with students on collecting data, qualitative study. So I'm, I live in the Atlanta area. And um and because of COVID, a lot of Black entrepreneurs uh, lost their businesses and things like that. So I'm working with students just trying to investigate what are some of the ways in which um, you could have better prepared for a pandemic. And so it's like a lived experience type study phenomenolo- um, phenomenology. Uh, we're just trying to figure out ways in which we can work together to really address uh, the problems of racial inequities within the Atlanta area. And it's very important to have students involved in that process as well, because many of our students today, um, they're really passionate about a number of um, issues related towards social entrepreneurship and sustainable development. And we have to work with them and ignite that passion. Yeah. Okay. Mike, We've got yeah. one, one last question from the chat in the AOM annual meeting portal. And then we can close. And so this is from Sabine Richter Trummer, who asked, what can you recommend regarding the risk of inertia in companies, which pot- potentially reduces scholarly impact? And that's, that's the entire question. I'll repeat it one more time. What can you recommend regarding the risk of inertia in companies, with pot- which potentially reduces the scholarly impact? And I'm assuming this part of this is that scholarly research can take years to publish mm-hmm. and it might be outdated when companies need to pivot and be agile in the very exact moment to remain, remain competitive, to stay uh, you know, current. So how do you marry the two of research that's current with the inertia of companies? Well, I think that's a good question, but that's life. You've got to try diverse avenues. Some work and some don't. Not every avenue is going to work and you're going to experience inertia and sometimes downright opposition. But it again goes back to what Leon said. You've got to care about what you do, believe in what you do, understand that there are different nuances and try different avenues. 
And I also would try to make lemonade out of the lemons uh, because it strikes me that that's a really interesting research question right there. You know, where does the inertia <laughs> come from? What are the different strategies for overcoming it? So was it Sabine? Sabine, yeah. Sabine, I, I think you got your work. Yeah. Your research agenda laid out very nicely there. <laughs> your research and your practice agenda. <laughs> yeah, I think... Um, I've, I've been listening to a book by Richard Thaler, who's the guy who invented Dutch. Yeah. I, I'm not right now blank remembering the name of the book, but he talks about some consulting he did once for a for a, for a ski ski something or other in in um, in Ithaca, New York, and some consulting he did for General Motors, and the the consulting he did with the guy who ran the the ski. What, what are ski things? What, I don't know. Lodge, Lodge, whatever. I don't, I don't know. He said the guy, he actually talked to the guy. The guy listened and he made some changes at work. He said the people at General Motors didn't care. And he was talking about, gee, what's the difference between a guy who runs a ski lodge who is actually analytical, wants to make a difference, versus this gigantic company that doesn't? I think that may be something beyond what an individual could do, if he can't even have an impact on him, that I, I think it's, if if we can't, then it's probably not our fault. Let's just put it like that. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know we're at time. And so first, thank you to everyone attending in person. Thank you, thank you to our panelists for your time and amazing expert research-based insights. And thank you to everyone attending live today and into the future.